safe. Welcome to today's session. There's uh, about 300 people signed up, so we'll give everybody a, a chance to um, log in. So I started this a couple minutes earlier just to um, make sure we had time for everybody to roll into um, this, this fun one. And if you are not sure if you're in the right place or not, this is the Health Seeker Technologies um, Data Lifecycle webinar. So hopefully, hopefully uh, this is what you signed up for, if you will. And we will get the party started in about a minute. We'll be on time just because there is a big crowd today and we wanna make sure that there's time for Q&A as well. And in the meantime, let's start the testing the chat function. So let's see if, uh, say hello. I'll say hello too. I'll do some shout outs and see who's here. Andrew Post, oh, tell and tell me what, what city and organization you're in too as well. Um, let's see. Hi, Joanne, Alimu Nenko, hello, Scott Campbell, Sharon Gertan, yeah. Uh, Greater Sudbury, Cassandra Hill, JC from Cups, I love Cups, Cups is in Calgary, it's uh, old friends of ours. Calgary Housing, Kelowna, BC Housing, Scott Campbell, awesome. Uh, Megan from Calgary Police, Funny story about police. I was just at a police conference in, in Washington, D.C. I got home really late last night. So if I'm not at my freshest, please uh, excuse me. Uh, there's some late nights <laughs> going on at conferences. So, um, but yeah, really interesting conversations happening right now with law enforcement in different parts of the world and the types of challenges that uh, they're facing and in terms of cybersecurity and cybercrime, fraud, uh, et cetera. So all relevant to uh, to all of us, I'm sure. Uh, Jackie at Lethbridge YMCA. Speaking of Lethbridge, we're doing some interesting stuff in Lethbridge right now, um, mapping uh, social challenges in different parts of the, the community as well. Uh, let's see, who else do I know here? Paula from Norfolk Housing. Hi, Paula. Norfolk Housing Association. Excellent. Uh, Paula, are you Norfolk Housing Association in, in Alberta or Norfolk Housing Association in Ontario? Um, wasn't sure. Surgeon Lake Cree Nation, Calgary John Howard. Hi, Kevin. Kevin and I, if, if it's the same Kevin I know, uh, go way back as well. And Tyler from Homeward Trust. Hey, Tyler, you, you owe me that cohort analysis, buddy. I was going to text you about it. Uh, Tyler and I are, are doing some analysis on chronic homelessness cohorts in, in Edmonton and how that's changed in the last 15 years. So uh, uh, we have a, a lot of fun with that. Uh, okay, let's see where we're at. A hundred. Okay, we'll give people another minute. Uh, Jason Gertson from my alma mater, Calgary Homeless Foundation. Hey, Sean from Altus Group. Um, Altus, if people are ever doing any uh, any work in the, with the private sector in terms of um, development, housing development, these guys are absolute experts, a major consulting group in, in the private sector. So think more along the lines of, of Deloitte, Accenture, but really focused on, on um, uh, real estate in particular. And Sean and I are doing some cool stuff in, in Airdrie. Um, Ministry of Housing, uh, um, Alemu, hi Alemu, Nenko. Uh, land of the Coast Salish people. Beautiful, beautiful. So that actually preempts uh, uh, my next step, which is if folks do know their, their territory or their First Nations um, uh, traditional territories, to, to definitely throw that in the hello as well. I'm joining you from Mokinsis, which is Treaty 7 in Calgary, Alberta. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll get this baby going because like I said, there's there's lots of participants today, like I said, 320. So who would have thought uh, the data life cycle was gonna be so exciting for the social impact sector, but hey, I mean, I'm I'm definitely all for that. This is, uh, this is my sweet spot as well in terms of interest. So um, like I said before, uh, welcome. I'm, I'm joining you from uh, Calgary, which is Treaty 7. And uh, I always do a shout out to my friend, Michael Fab because I promote him. He's a, he's a Diné artist. Uh, we met at a, at a farmer's market about 10 years ago when uh, I uh, wanted to, um, to bring somebody with uh, First Nations and lived experience of homelessness to help me on 
uh, visualizing the, you know, the some of the work that I was doing in Yellowknife. And it just so happens I meet a guy from that experienced homelessness in Yellowknife who was Danae as well. And you know, since then we've become fast friends and I promote his work because um, starving artists are, are absolutely a, a thing. And so if anybody's ever looking for Indigenous art, I've already connected some folks to, to him uh, to, uh, to sell some of his, his stuff to, uh, and, and he does custom work as well. So if you're ever looking at um, a painting or a mural or things like that, he's done all of that and travels all over the, uh, all over the place. So do get in touch with me if you want to uh, get an introduction to him. So uh, two seconds about Health Seeker, just make sure you know uh, who we are and, and why we're doing these um, webinars. Once a month, we do educational webinars to bring some of our knowledge when it comes to technology in terms of complex social challenges. And so most of the folks that join us have an interest in social issues specifically, but you come from all over, as you can see in the in the chat, private sector, public sector, all um, all types of uh, nonprofits, anywhere from mental health, domestic violence, affordable housing, homelessness, we, we're all represented for sure. Um, food security as well, uh, just to name a few. And so we, we try to bring folks together on these webinars to share our learnings and um, share some of the tools that might be of use to you guys in, in your day-to-day -day work as well. Um, for us though, what we specialize is in, in software, uh, data science, data analytics, and connecting that to what does this mean when it comes to complex social challenges. So that interpretation of, of the data as well, but it's all from a tech lens. And so we often collaborate with um, other folks that might be doing more of that community engagement and development, uh, other folks that, that might have a special expertise like, like Sean at Altus that have a, a different area of expertise, and we layer in that social aspect as well, but this is our, our sweet spot for sure is complex social issues. So agenda for today, we, um, we debated long and hard about what we wanted to bring to you this month. And one of the things that we've been um, really, really driving forward on with some of our customer success in terms of using data is this idea of a data life cycle. So uh, if you don't know what it is, that's okay. This is what this, this whole thing is about. And if you do know what a data life cycle is, hopefully this is going to give you that pause to uh, consider um, how this applies to a project that you're currently doing, or even a refresher or a different lens of of thinking about the data life cycle as well when it comes to complex social challenges. So we'll we'll get into that in particular and we'll get into uh, the details of it and, and I'll use some of my experience for uh, um, for examples as well, just to connect it to some of you. And I, I, I read your different job description, so I'm gonna try to uh, connect as many examples as, as, uh, as I can during the presentation, but I do wanna make sure we have a chance to for you guys to also chime in as well on the chat and uh, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. So what's the data life cycle? Um, easiest way to describe it is is exactly as, as a cycle. Uh, it's the idea that data is not a, a linear process. It's not one thing. It actually you actually have to think about data as a series of steps that are in constant circuit, right? So it's uh, everything from the generation, the creation of data uh, to the collection all the way to the interpretation. So what does this data mean for my um, particular strategy that I'm trying to develop or for solving a particular problem? And when we skip these steps in our thinking or we, we focus too much on number one and not enough on number six, and there's this imbalance in terms of our approach to data, that's where we run into majority of, of problems that we that we see at least from our experience working in, in communities. So we'll we'll break this down for you in a in a second, but uh, that's the the first key message is that it truly is a life cycle. And so the same way that that humans and, and animals and bi biological uh, beings um, move through life cycles, so uh, early growth and and decay, right? And uh, the retirement of data for sure, just like humans, uh, data goes through should go through that type of a process and understanding where your data is in, in this life cycle is important. 
and not all of the data is going to have the same life cycle. So you might have data sets that have been here forever that you have, you know you haven't even been mining for a long time, and you you keep collecting them, but there's not they're not they might need to be retired as well. So having a, a process in place that has all these steps is really important at the organizational level to have that strategy. So why this matters in social impact? And you could probably uh, guess that I'm gonna talk about data-informed decision-making, but we're not collecting data for, uh, for fun and games. It's usually because there's a business problem to be solved. Um, the majority of, of problems that we see in our work and where, whether it's with law enforcement or prevention, mental health and, and uh, youth needs, for instance, it's usually because the program design or program impact uh, requires us to make better and better decisions. We have limited resources. We wanna know if we're spending the time on the right aspect of the work. Is the, the right service getting matched to the right client? Is the right dose of the service uh, being delivered at the right time to a particular client at that base client level? And then how does that roll up in terms of a program portfolio? So most organizations, if we think of them as, as uh, collections of, of uh, business areas or expertise areas, programs are almost like your investment vehicle in terms of your social impact and ensuring that you're distributing your human capital, majority of, of us are spending most of our budget on people that are delivering that, that value to other people. So are we putting the right resources in terms of our human assets, our, our experts, our social workers, our uh, resource specialists? Are they going into, into the right bucket and, and are we servicing those buckets in, in the right way? So informed decisions, resource allocation uh, obviously go hand in hand. Um, program evaluation is, a, is another often used one as well, where we uh, talk about the need to understand whether a program is having the right impact. We develop the logic models oftentimes, or, um, or at least uh, outcome chains in some cases that try to articulate what the inputs and the outputs and the outcomes are because of... Uh, uh, usually funding uh, agreements, but I would also say there is a, a bigger drive, which is, are we doing the right the right work and are we doing it in the right way? So there is a, a program evaluation as, aspect to, to why we care about the data life cycle. Transparency and trust is another key area because again, we're stewards on behalf of government. Um, most of the time, there's about 80% of us are receiving funding from a uh, regional, uh, provincial, territorial, federal government, uh, or local municipal government or First Nations uh, governments, Métis um, as well have their, have their own resource allocation processes. And of course the uh, Inuit. So the transparency and trust, because we are entr uh, entrusted with um, other people's money, if you will, to do, uh, to do good with that money. Are we being transparent with it? Are we ensuring that as much of that funding goes into, into the impact that we want to see. And there's very little um, out there outside of data that will inspire that trust. So we're often called upon even more and more of late to, um, to show how decisions are being made. And, and there's always the question, you know, what's been your impact or how many people have you served? So there's always these questions that we constantly get asked. And there's always the, the critiques of, or the incredulousness that comes with it um, in, in, at least in some contexts for sure. Maybe not, maybe not your personal experience, but I'm definitely seeing these calls for show me the data more and more. Um, when it gets to things that are more exciting from a data science perspective, we're always wanting to go that next step, which is anticipating need, uh, predictive insights. If we have this type of a need in this community, what might be the right program to make sure is, is in place? And how big should the caseload be? Uh, if the caseload is this right now, what might the caseload anticipated be in, in the next five, 10, 20 years? And we just finished a, a project with York Region looking at uh, the projections for social housing need up to 2045, believe it or not. So really far into the future, um, building social master plans is a is a great uh, context for these predictive insights come in at that population level, 
but I would say it, it uh, drills even further down into predictive insights at the client level as well. So if we know from experience, uh, one thing ab about, uh, you know, the past predicts the, the future for sure to, to some extent, but uh, there's also been, been new uh, challenges that have emerged that might challenge that. And so sometimes the data can give you predictive insights that you might not see from, from the naked eye. Uh, an example of that would be, uh, again, I'm trying to connect it to, to real world examples, um, is even something as, uh, as critical as uh, Alpha House is, a, is an organization in Calgary that works on or, or with folks uh, that are experiencing mental health and addictions, active substance use. And one of the big changes that they've seen in the last you know, five years has been the obviously the rise of, of fentanyl in the in the drug supply. And that has completely changed the types of um, risk levels in their in their client population. So that the type of interventions uh, should obviously shift and how they do their work needs to shift as well. So just because it was you know, one type of substance in the past, and for them it was it used to be alcohol. That's not the case anymore. The most common substance that people come in with in in, in this particular program in the shelter in particular is is actually fentanyl. But the combinations of fentanyl with other types of of drugs is also interesting too to see and how that manifests by gender. Right. So there's a you know the combination of fentanyl with trank is uh, much more common for certain demographics, for instance, than, than others. So what does that mean when, when somebody comes in? How do you, how do you shift your, your response accordingly? And then lastly, it's the idea of enhanced collaboration. So collecting the data within a program to, to do better with, within your team, sitting down and actually looking at the data from a strategy perspective and program design perspective within a team, but then also how do these pieces come together at the organizational level and then rolling that up at the at the collaborative systems level as well. And we're all part of nested networks to that extent. And having the data to contribute to those conversations becomes so, so powerful. Um, the layering of data is probably where I see the most gains from a systems perspective when organizations can obviously anonymize and make sure you're not sharing things that you shouldn't be sharing. But when the data layers are added, the insights that you get just by simply looking at the data as a collaborative become enormous. Um, quick example of that, and I referenced Lethbridge for a second, uh, but the agreement was, and for the first time, uh, police and fire and 311 and social services actually layering the data on top of each other to understand uh, communities in need earlier on with the premise, of course, that how do we get ahead of it, of uh, some of these social challenges? What kind of preventative programming can we put in place at the neighborhood level, anticipating future needs as well? So work in progress on all of these things, but that's the value of, of looking at the data life cycle from this bigger strategic context. So why the data life cycle matters in, in more detail? Again, I'll, I'll reflect on, on each parts of the data cycle. The first one is data generation. And data generation is, is simply the concept that if you, if you don't have the data, then you can't, can't really do much with it. However, um, one thing that people often forget is that data is generated all the time. And so we leave data traces in our daily existence. So the way we use technology leaves that digital trail, of course. Um, that's the same as, as service users as well. We've got lots of data that, that is generated without us even knowing about it. So a key consideration for you is to, to actually understand and catalog where data is generated in your organization as well. And again, uh, looking at um, unconventional data sources and data is not just the, the quantitative numbers. Uh, you've got data that comes through uh, qualitative insight. You've got data that comes in as insights of your staff as well. And having, a, having an understanding that that happens and then how, considering how you capture it and for what purpose becomes really, really key. Um, one of the things that, again, I'm, I'm reflecting on what I learned at the, at the security summit in, in Washington, DC. And one of the things that, um, that police chiefs in different parts of, um, of North America have, have reported is how critical it was to get the insights from the frontline um, officers. And again, you, you 
can make the equivalency to your to your shops as well. We we all have those folks at the front line that are seeing the changes in real time. Um, having a an organization that listens to that and has a process for appreciating it and giving it that same level of um, of value as we might the formal administrative data has been a major insight. And so layering the expert, the frontline expert with the data coming coming through some of the traditional sources was something I, I that really resonated for me. Then engaging with community voices. Again, you're you're probably connecting with community voices all the time. And those voices are are, you know, there's so much that comes out in these conversations that that you might be having. But again, if we're not prioritizing and we're not, we don't have a means of capturing it or something to do with it, then it's not going to make it into your into those strategic conversations um, and in terms of shifting your practice. And this concept of balancing data collection is, is another piece because. Uh, if you actually stop and think about all the data that's being generated in the course of doing business, then um, you know, do how much do you really need to to over collect, right? If you're if you're fully understanding how much you have, um, there's often this idea that we don't have data in the social sector, and I have completely changed uh, my perspective working in the sector. And whenever somebody says we, you know, we don't have data, we don't have data. I, I, I beg to differ. We have a, an extreme amount of data that's being generated, uh, and I would also say that it's being collected. What we don't have is a is a solid process for cataloging and connecting the dots between what we generate and what we analyze and what we do with it downstream. So that's a that's step one. Um, step two: data collection. And uh, it might be a little bit of a mind bender to think of generating data and collecting data as two separate parts of the data life cycle, but I promise you they are. They're extremely uh, different. You can generate data and not collect it, right? We, we do that all the time. And um, data collection, capturing it, gathering it uh, systematically, having a process by which we, we can actually categorize the data coming in, and, and doing what we can to, to make sure that it's stored properly, that collection process is an absolute part of the data life cycle as well. So strategic data gathering involves you thinking about what it is exactly you're, you're trying to answer. Um, what I see as a major mistake in the sector is that we, um, we don't really know. So we try to gather everything that possibly might happen. So we, uh, as a result of that, we have intake forms that are 30 pages long and data that sits in, in data, databases and reams and reams of data tables that have never actually been mined, uh, where we can, you know, not we cannot say with a straight face that collecting that data point has made a difference in people's lives. So I challenge you to, to think about that as well in your in your shops. Where is data being gathered systematically? And is that is that happening through a software system? Excellent. Is that happening through focus groups? And what is the connection between why you collected and uh, and a decision that has uh, occurred as well. One note about case management software too, and this is probably the most common way that I see data being collected. Of course, there's there's surveys and focus groups and, and things um, of that nature, but uh, more and more we see uh, the nonprofit sector is, and of course the government has been doing this uh, for a long time as well, but case management software, uh, that's being used or sometimes referred to as a CRM, customer relations management in the more on the private sector side, but it, it, it involves capturing the client profile and then capturing the activities that are happening with that client over time. And then uh, corroborating that with um, questionnaires about impact and rolling that up at the organizational level to answer the question of uh, return on investment. So if we had this, this much staff, this much caseload, this much turnover, and this much pre and post uh, measurement in terms of areas of, of um, or issues that the clients were being supported on, what's been the impact of, of the intervention. So case management software is, is oftentimes something that, that folks have in place. Um, that is a, is a major, major way that you can collect this data. If you don't have one, talk to us. We we can tell you all about it. 
Um, ethical data practices, of course, this involves the, the uh, issue around privacy and privacy impact assessments as well. This is an area that's a bit uncomfortable to talk about because we're all uh, different degrees of bad when it comes to uh, uh, sometimes over collection of data, like I mentioned before. Um, other times it's misunderstanding of uh, privacy requirements as well, or thinking we understand it and, and, um, and actually turns out that, that we don't. So uh, we do have a whole PIA um, module or, uh, or webinar that we did last year. So I encourage you if you're, if, you, if this is something that's that's of interest, I, I won't spend more more time than than just to rem, remind us that data collection involves ethical data practices, not just on a legal end, but also, also on the ethics end. So OCAP principles and how do you balance FOIP and OCAP uh, principles is, is a consideration. For those of you that that don't aren't familiar with uh, with OCAP principles around the collection of, um, of data when it relates to Indigenous communities. I definitely encourage you to uh, look up the First Nations Governance Center. They have a fantastic uh, resource where you can get certified in, in OCAP so that you can take that knowledge and apply it across your organization as well. Okay, uh, the next step here for us is data processing. And um, oftentimes we, we underestimate how um, data comes in and how you take the data that comes in and actually make it into something useful. Uh, and that part is called the data process. <laughs> so um, if you can imagine data that comes, comes into a survey format, uh, the big mistake that often happens is when we have um, incomplete data. So uh, the person fills out um, the client information and they, they're supposed to put in the let's say the gender and they they forget to or they don't uh, it's not a requirement before they move to the next screen and so they don't so incompleteness of data is probably the most common uh, data cleaning problem that that we see in our work and that it's easy to fix but it's also way easier to prevent as a problem and i'll i'll give you an example without outing anyone um, but uh, doing an analysis to see where um, clients are coming from in terms of communities, if you have a, a regional uh, catchment area, and uh, in one, one of our uh, customers, when we looked at their data, about uh, only 20% had, um, ac not accurate, but complete information on where the clients were coming from. And so their question, their business requirement was a good one, which was to say, do we need to do outreach differently in these communities so that we make sure we have we're, we're servicing all the areas equitably and we're servicing the areas with the most need um, to the to the right level of support and were they collecting the data were they generating the data yes were they collecting it yes but in data processing we real we actually saw that no you can't really make any statements if you only have two out of ten <laughs> It's a, it's really difficult. Uh, it, it's actually it's impossible to make a statement about that. So, in your data processing approach, and this is why it's a life cycle, you want to be able to to reflect on this and say, well, could I have done something differently in you know in the data collection step to prevent this problem from happening in data processing? And the answer was quite simple. Uh, it was actually to create a drop down instead of a fill in the form. Uh, drop down and make it a requirement in, in, in the data collection form. So really easy ways of increasing your data uh, quality and the reliability of it, of course. But if, you, if you're not thinking about these steps, then you're not gonna find the, the problem, right? You have to break down the entire step uh, systematically and, and go back and, and fix it as well. Um, another uh, key element here too, the integrated collection is, a, is another consideration. So uh, we have this uh, this problem. I'd say probably the data processing part. Now that I'm talking about it, I feel this is the one where we probably need to pay the most attention to as uh, the social sector, because we underestimate uh, underestimate the step. So integrated collection and enhancing the efficiency of integrated collection. What I mean by this is we we actually have quite a bit of data that's that's collected in pockets. So program one collected with this software, program two has a survey, program three doesn't do anything, program four has pieces of paper. Um, so 
completely inefficient. We have no idea if it's the same clients that are, if, and I'm talking the same organization. We're not even rolling up to the system level yet. Never mind. That's never going to happen if you can't get this part in your own organization right. But step one is having that integration within the organization. And why is that critical? Well, it's one thing to report on a program for a particular funder, and that's that's great. If paper is okay with that, and you've got a nice old lady that's the big donor and she doesn't even care about data, that's awesome. But from an organizational perspective, you're, it's impossible to say what your holistic impact and how these programs fit as part of a bigger um, investment portfolio in, in your people and in your clients. And so that integration up, up front is absolutely essential. I'll give you a, an example from Homeward Trust because they, uh, I know Tyler's here and he knows exactly what I'm, I'm going to probably refer to. And I'll, I'll give you a, an easy example and a hard example. The, the most extreme case of this that, that we've seen in the last year uh, was Homeward Trust, where they invested in, I think, 40 different programs. Now, up here in the data collection, the, they had one data case management software that was uh, doing this. So on, on paper, the data collection was actually not the problem. Where we saw the challenge was actually in the, the business rules around integrating um, what that data looked like in processing. So as a, as a really good example, it, the way that they cut and slice the data in processing wasn't done in a uh, consistent documented way that allowed us to be able to, uh, to get the same number every time. Right? So those business rules need to be captured and, and actually reflected in the step-by-step -step process of bringing these 40 data sets together, even though they came from the same database. So just because they're in the same data collection doesn't mean the processing is, is going to get you magically get you that result without putting thought and process in, in place to do that. So that's a that's a really extreme example because we actually looked at 15, uh, 15, sorry, 15 years of data and and changes in, in these business rules over time make it extremely complicated. So what I would advise you on is document documentation having a data dictionary so that people understand capturing changes in how data is being collected and processed is absolutely essential, especially with turnover in our sector. Trying to, I think our, the biggest challenge for that we had, uh, and Tyler wasn't, wasn't hired then, but, uh, but other folks from Homeward Trust will remember is trying to go backwards and figure out what happened in 2022 and versus 2009. So what you can do as a favor to people that come after you is actually uh, have this stuff documented. Um, and then the last part I'll, I'll say on this is most of this data processing can be automated, uh, luckily. So it doesn't have to be this so painful. Uh, having a, a data collection process that automatically, uh, and, and as tasks are automated in data processing and then in data analysis and interpretation, there's a lot that can be done and when we automate and uh, data pipelines, if anybody has heard of it, that's what we're talking about here, right? There's just like a pipeline has different stages of processing the raw material. The same thing with data here too. And pipelines, you know, are primary are really automated these days. And same with data pipelines. If you if you um, have that as a major major priority and you're wanting to advance some of the stuff and save time, automation of routine tasks and data processing are a really nice way to go. But of course, you need to have things documented because you can't automate something that isn't recorded. So step one, start with starting with the baby steps. All right, let me just see how I'm doing on time. Okay, things, things are okay. Uh, data storage. And this is a, a another step that people often uh, bypass. But securing your data, I mean, we basically think, okay, is my server in Canada? Yes. Okay. Uh, is there encryption? Absolutely. Um, are we, but are, are we also thinking about um, the storage, tailoring the storage to need? Is it organized properly? It, and you got to remember if uh, it's just like your file folders, if on your desktop, if people come in and they can't find something and there isn't a, a really clear way that you've cataloged uh, where your data is and, and what the storage looks like, if and you're scaling that over time because more and more data comes in, your storage needs are, are going to increase. Um, security 
uh, requirements change over time as well. Security, cyber threats change over time as well. So you want to make sure you're, you have a strategy around your data storage as well. The tip that we have from our experience, I mean, we, we're agnostic in terms of our data vendors. We, we use whoever the best is, um, but AWS, which at Amazon Web Services, and Microsoft Azure are the two that we use from um, really, really sensitive data perspective. Uh, we err on the side of Microsoft Azure, um, but I mean, AWS has very robust solutions as well. And it's not something I would recommend doing as a novice. I, I really do think you, you need some professional support on making sure your servers are, are set up correctly. Um, and absolutely yes to going into the cloud. Nobody is nobody's storing things in a server in, in their room anymore. Um, I mean, by all means, if that's the case for you, if that is still the case for you, I, I really encourage you to, to modernize that infrastructure sooner rather than later because the, um, the, the, it's just how the world is moving uh, right now. And there's a number of reasons for it. Um, a lot of the service, services that are now available through the cloud are, are much more robust, much more reliable. Uh, if a, a disaster happens in one part of the country, you know that there's a backup of it and you're getting the benefits of scale, right? So you're, you're never going to be as good at securing your server in your, in your room as, as some of these server farms that are, that have that 24 seven security, et cetera. So uh, again, I, I highly recommend paying attention to this, uh, redundancy and reliability, um, is another key consideration. So not, you know, not having just one copy, having the, the backup copies and, and regular backup and auditability is, is really critical as well. Um, data management comes to uh, some of the organizational practices as well. Um, so data management strategies are, um, are, again, sometimes confused with data storage versus data management. When we talk about data management, uh, I'll, I'll give you some, some examples of this, but this is where some of your processes and policies come into play. Um, this is where some of your organizational practices and having, having training for staff on data management, um, who has access to what, for what purpose, absolutely also part of your, uh, your privacy requirements. But it's, it's much bigger than just privacy, right? Because you're, you're also needing to think about the data life cycle again. So thinking about how old the data is, who's using the data for what purpose, do we have a nice catalog? of all the data sets that we have in place. Uh, it might be a, a bigger issue for more complex organizations. If you're a small organization, this doesn't have to be hard. And a lot of this stuff has been templated already. So it's it's not difficult to take somebody's template and, and adapt it to your needs as well. But documenting it and training staff on it on an ongoing basis becomes really essential. For us, what we have is a, a data management policy. Um, it's privacy by design as a, as a concept that's infused with it. And, and in it, we, uh, we try to document as much as we can. We have that reviewed by uh, privacy experts as well so that we're, we're not missing anything. And we, we, try to, we try to keep that up to date on an ongoing basis as well. So having a, a data management policy gives you a sense of, of knowing, uh, at least knowing what your game plan is. Uh, and then something to, to work off of to, to um, enhance data man management practices as well. If you're interested in this, uh, we do have a question, like a self-assessment questionnaire that each of our departments use to see where, where they're at in their data management practices and, and identify areas of improvement because it's an ongoing cycle, how, how you do this, this work in your team. Um, and again, teams come and go, uh, different requirements come in, new data sets come in. So you, you do want to keep some, some of this stuff up to date and, and do an assessment like that at least once a year, for sure. So if that's an interest, let me know. We're happy to share it. It's, it's open source. And I, I wouldn't do justice if I didn't give credit to George Alvarez, uh, who's a uh, privacy expert that developed uh, the basis of, of that tool. Uh, data analysis, this is probably the, the part where people get the most excited and everybody just hops to data analysis. Um, this is where we take the raw material that hopefully now it's nice and clean and in nice formats that we can analyze. And now we can go to town on it. And now we can start applying um, anything as, as fancy as machine learning, but also some basic stuff, like how many people came through the door. Pretty, pretty simple things to, to start out with. 
I find this is the part that people want to skip to right away. And so they'll, they'll, uh, they'll say, you know, help seeker, here's all my data. And so we'll get like 20 data sets and then we'll open them and we're like, oh crap, like this, this is, we got a, we got a lot of cleaning to do here. It's, this is not ready for analysis. So, um, people often get the most excited about the analysis and they'll say, you know, do, I want you to do some machine learning on it. And you're like, yeah, but like, this is only 20 rows. Like I, you know, some data is not going to be uh, well suited to certain types of analysis. I would really encourage people to get the basics done, like basic frequency, just do an exploration of, of uh, what the data tells you. Or if you're, if you're hiring out or outsourcing your data analysis, get them to do the exploratory, what's called the exploratory data analysis where, you know, let's let your, your team get familiar with it before you jump to, to fancy stuff. Um, because that is the, you know, that is probably the, the biggest mistake that I see. Um, I'd also look at uh, data sets uh, on their own merit before linking them together as well, because there's a lot of insights you can get just, you know, having that focus on, you know, let's look at program X, let's look at uh, the data set on shelter intakes, for instance, and then let's look at the, the data set on, on housing outcomes, um, kind of understand it on its own, spend the time with it, um, and I would also uh, tip you that uh, it's not something you do once. Yeah, and I see that mistake as well. What we've learned over time is that you want to drip the content to your staff, to your um, to your leadership teams if you're in a uh, in a decision support role, because people think that it's a you know you do the data analysis, you get the report, and then you move on. And I would actually say it's data uh, analysis and insights should be something that that happens on a on an ongoing basis in in your workflow that's what it means to be data informed right so um, considering what the analytical techniques might be uh, doesn't have to be as fancy as machine learning either you can get a lot out of the data um, without getting fancy with it using it is the, the most important part i see as well so uh, analysis is again where we make sense of the data, where we're we're you know we're looking at the frequency, we're looking at percentages, we're looking at trend analysis over time, uh, we're looking at uh, I was mentioning before cohort analysis, clusters, you know do do certain clients have certain characteristics? Do certain clients with certain characteristics do better uh, with this type of an intervention than others? Why? Right? And you want to engage with the data. And this is the, where, where folks um, you know, should be. This is why you're, you're doing this, is to ask it these strategic questions. Um, we want the data visualization that feeds off of the analysis. Right, This is where we, we do the, uh, the data crunching, if you will. But then we want to visualize it in, in an engaging way. And that's a, the next step as well. And again, sometimes people conflate analysis with visualization. They're, they're actually two separate steps, two separate skill sets. And in our team, we have data analysts, data scientists, and visual, data visualization experts, because it, it is a science in and of itself. Uh, you're not going to have the luxury of that in, in smaller shops. I totally understand. Um, outsource uh, some of the stuff if, if it is a big project or if you want to get it set up. Because uh, you know, you know, in some ways it's an ongoing refinement process. But consider uh, something as simple. This is lend itself to a bar graph or a pie chart. And Lori, who's on our data visualization expert, she hates pie charts. She just hates them. She thinks they're um, an abomination to to uh, to the profession. Um, but you know, for for me, I, I you know I keep going to them for for some stupid reason. Um, but again, being really mindful of why a bar graph, why a why a um, a column chart. There's amazing tools for data visualization. Uh, don't mistake them for uh, uh, for data analysis, though. And uh, I, I get again, I I get into this with Lori all the time because I like the pretty things. Um, why? Because to me, data visualization is about data storytelling. It's about engagement and communication. And for her, it's got to, yeah, but it's got to, it's got to show the truth too, because sometimes some of the data visualization tools are actually not very uh, systematic in, in their uh, uh, representation of, of the accuracy uh, levels as well. So good tools that we love uh, and use all the time are Tableau, 
um, a little bit of Microsoft BI, but I don't know. Uh, the team loves Tableau more uh, for for its look, its uh, aesthetics, and I'm sure Lori will say, yeah. And there's a lot more you can do with Tableau than Microsoft BI, but that's a preference. Um, however, most of uh, the analytics uh, software that that is in the marketplace has some basic visualization already built into it, so you don't you shouldn't have to do that much work. If anybody's played around with SurveyMonkey recently, you'll see that a lot of this stuff is already um, pre-baked um, when it comes to data visualization as well. What I would encourage you with data visualization um, best practices is to think about accessibility. Think about not putting more than uh, one, uh, max two data points on, on a, as you can see in, in this little example, um, this yellow line, I don't know if you can see it, it's actually, uh, cocaine prices, uh, street prices um, versus uh, versus uh, wholesale. So, uh, and it's what I, what it's trying to show you is that cocaine prices in street level have uh, have increased, but wholesale prices have decreased. In other words, it's getting cheaper and cheaper to produce, but it's still the street price is still high. So, something like that um, lends itself really nicely to to this type of a, a graphical representation because you can see the kind of the shift the crossover um, in other instances uh, not not as much so uh, this other chart in this report is showing you the homelessness uh, rates changes uh, between 2016 and 2022 and you can see each city changing um, and then you can see the seven cities average and, and the color change is important because uh, the blue represents cities but the yellow represents an average. So again, you're trying to draw attention to uh, to the point you're trying to make with these visualizations. So the message is think about it, right? Think about why you're why you're doing it the way you are is the biggest thing. And of course, people love pictures. Pictures say everything much much better than than words. But I also find that um, without the last part, which is data interpretation, what the heck do I care about this for? Um, it, it falls apart as well. So understanding context and implications, informed decision-making and actionable insights for improvement. It's not enough to give people the charts or the reports. You literally need to go to that last step. And I would say the data life cycle ends with interpretation and starts again, <laughs> over and over again. Interpretation is, is saying, why do I care? Like, let's go back to this. Why, why does the, the price of, of street drugs um, decreasing from a production perspective at that organized crime level, what does that have to do with homelessness in, in Alberta, right? So um, it, as you can see here, it's, it's drawing it home. This is, what it, this is why we care about this. This is, this is gonna be the implications of that. And then uh, connecting the dots to the business, uh, the business um, um, requirement. What we're trying to answer here is how might we prepare our social safety net for some of these changes that we're seeing in, in the broader environment? And, and what, what does that mean for our programmatic interventions? What does that mean for our social policy? What does that mean for policing versus uh, preventative social care? Completely different working context. So if you don't do that last step of interpretation, this whole thing that we just talked about Kind of for not, isn't it? Because it doesn't actually lead to any uh, meaningful action. You didn't influence the action because of all that work. So it, um, I would just, again, consider this bringing it all the way home and finishing the job. And then, of course, it, it goes on and on and on because this, this stuff is, uh, you're constantly learning from it. So you're, you're going back into the cycle and you're, you're starting over again. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm putting this back up because you need to close the loop. Uh, learning something about methamphetamines and, and benzos and, and, and connection to homelessness, putting that into context, policy context or programmatic context, um, what does that have to do with food distribution networks? And I guarantee you transportation networks have a lot to do with everything. <laughs> so, um, so does that change what we collect and, and how we collect it? And uh, does, that, does that change uh, what, we, what we consider in terms of data generation? Out there, what data is being generated, for instance, at the border crossings that might um, add value to our analysis of of some of these social trends as well. So you're always considering this 
over time. Um, you're also considering that open data sources um, need to get layered in now into your analysis as well, because it's one thing to look at programmatic information within your organization. It's another one to take that and put it into this bigger context uh, that I was getting at with some of these, these other data sets as well. So it really should be an ongoing, never-ending cycle. And I'm, I'm so sorry that it's a never-ending cycle because that, that is the point of it. Uh, Data-informed decision-making is, is truly a, kind of a, an endless loop of insight and action and refinement and strategy uh, development that, that is constantly adapting to our learnings and our broader environment. And if, if that's not why you're doing it, then, you know, it, probably not doing it right is my my takeaway of doing this for for my entire career um a couple of notes about refinement as well and just some considerations assessing the data relevance and sufficiency um, absolutely there's things that you need to collect you need to report to your funders uh, but being critical and and doing those uh, ongoing audits again once a year take stock are we collecting the right data that's helping us close the loop. Uh, if we're not using the data, then why not? Is, is it the wrong thing that we're collecting? Do we need to update how we visualize? Do we need to update how we interpret? Where are you falling short, right? So consider the one through eight. If you gave yourself a one to five rating on each of those items, you know, are you crushing it in, in data collection? You've got a five out of five, you're collecting as, as much as you need, but you're, you're a zero out of five on interpretation because you're not taking it all the way home. Your CEO doesn't get it. Your CEO doesn't even quote um, most of the data that, that you're collecting. Then there's interpretation that needs to happen. Uh, I'd also consider that interpretation and servicing the organization really depends on the context of, of the staff using the data. So frontline workers' insight needs, interpretation needs are very different. What mean, What's meaningful to them in their day-to-day -day life is going to be completely different than the CEO. And we can't gloss over that. And we can't think, well, I'm just going to do one, one dashboard or one report to serve them all. Like you, you missed it because you're not collect, connecting it to that, to that, um, uh, that business uh, requirement. And I say business requirement just because that's the, the language we use in, in the data world. But um, you know, biz, your business is, is supporting people at, at the end of the day. So uh, that's the, the key there. Uh, the minimization of data over collection, just another plug there that we see uh, more data being collected than being used in uh, driving action. And that data collection strategy should always be refined. So it's not a static thing. Just, and I've seen it a, uh, quite a long time where um, new data gets added, but uh, data that's no longer being collected is, is still being collected haphazardly. So having a, a really nice clean process that you're refining over time is a, another just a, a reminder and, and tip um, for you. So um, with that being said, if there are folks that are into um, data collection and interpretation, the, the big sneak peek, and we said we, we promised last time we would tell you guys about this, uh, this last piece of the compass puzzle, uh, there was a, a huge R&D project where we got investment from CMHC, Microsoft, and uh, um, Infrastructure Canada via the digital supercluster uh, to develop three products. Uh, we had two out, Cardo, which is the data analytics, and uh, one, uh, Navigi, which is connecting people to social services, which is that, you know, what Health Seeker has been known for from the beginning. The last piece of the puzzle was connecting um, all of that with client level data. And so this is the, this is the big reveal, and we're going to do a big big webinar on this uh, next time as well. Um, but this is this is it. Uh, the baby has has been born. Uh, the idea being that you can customize the data collection and automatically visualize uh, the data, enhancing the data management and automation is, is the big one. Um, you're looking at at some uh, screenshots of some of the implementations, the early implementations as well. Um, but the cool part for us is it, it really brings it all together because it allows you to have that data management, streamlined data collection, and, and the automation of uh, notifications, for instance. So if somebody comes in, everybody in the organization gets a notification that, you know, so-and-so is in the building. That's, that's one example. The other one is to automatically populate 
the data analysis in, in real time so that you, you understand the analytics as you go. Um, and then the, the differentiator for us here is that you don't need a software degree to do it. So uh, you can develop this stuff um, on your own and update your data collection uh, straight into your client software management so that you're not putting in a request to the vendor and you know figuring it out in five years. You can actually go uh, do this extremely affordable, uh, extremely out of, easy to use out of the box. And um, the biggest, biggest, biggest thing for me has been the ability to share data at the client level between organizations with client permission. So this truly being that coordinated access at scale across systems of care uh, is the, the huge win for me um, as personal highlight. So that's the, the big uh, announcement here and, and um, sneak peek for you guys. But like I said, if, if, this is, if you're in need of a client software, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for the clap. I know this is like a career in the making, right? Uh, huge, huge win. And uh, excited to share it with you guys. Uh, if you're interested, Trav, uh, I'm sure is going to be excited to tell you all about it. We have way more on this coming up because uh, this is this is where we're going. Uh, I mentioned some of the coordinated care pathways, integrated referral management, and that seamless collaboration is the biggest thing. And the whole thing, you know, we're teaching the fish um, fishing instead of fishing for you, right? Because you guys can can do this without specialized um, specialized skills is the biggest thing. So um, yeah, I think that's it. Let's do Q and A's and I think we have one. Uh, how can this information be implemented into our staff policies for our own organizations? Okay, uh, Herman Montague is asking that. Um, Herman, um, the data life cycle, I would say where, where I would have that and Actually, I'll, I'll get I'll get my team to send out the assessment, the self-assessment on um, kind of privacy readiness and things like that. But I would say that's that's the best place is to integrate it into your uh, policy manuals and in your training uh, training schedules as well. Um, it, and again, just use templates and and modify them. Um, if you guys haven't done the ChatGPT course uh, built that we did last year. Um, Maybe that's another thing we can do, uh, team, is to show people how to auto-generate some of their policies <laughs> so that we can, you know, we can feed feed the system, uh, the the legal requirements and things like that. It's not it's not going to be perfect, but it'll streamline it for you guys as well, so that you you have the stuff written out. Once you have it written and processed, then you can build a training schedule around it. But that I would say that's the best place is to um, implement it into your into your training and your ongoing training with staff and probably where it fits is in your uh, privacy, where, wherever the organization keeps the, their privacy policies, you should, can add a chapter on data management, for instance. And again, use use our templates if, uh, to start get you started for sure. Um, let's see what else we got here in the chat. Looking forward, cool, cool, cool. Okay, Q and A. Is there um, more questions? And team, team, if you see any from the um, yeah from the other uh, uh, venues, because I think we're live streaming on LinkedIn. Okay, and if we don't, then that's cool too. We can let you guys out early, but let's see. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. We'll join the next one. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, let's see. Looking forward. Okay, I think we're okay. Oh, no, we got one more. Okay, uh, cost per organization, it's about $40 a month a user is how we're pricing it. We just, we're competing with the Salesforce's Microsoft Dynamics as the competitors. Um, yeah, but the big, the big thing is the sharing between services, which Richard just, uh, um, just rightly points out. Obviously you guys have to have, you know, permission and all that kind of stuff. But um, you know, some of the implementations we are supporting organizations on their PIAs too. I think that's a it's just a, an add-on service. I think we were chatting with one of the um, native friendship centers around that as well. That so if you're implementing a new software, this is a good time to update your policies on data management, and we can put that as part of the implementation.